salesman when I say that. Um, I am selling you nothing but pure joy, pure joy, the ultimate product. Um, unfortunately, pure joy is on its, on its way because Reza is still not here. He's actually at the airport and believe it or not, will join us from said airport, but he's actually stuck in the middle of uh, security right now. <laughs> Wish him luck, but he'll join us soon. Um, and as, wow, there are already so many comments in the chat. Hello, hello. Um, as always, we'd love to open it up to um, a case presenter. So any one of our friends, our 35 friends here have a case that they would like to present. This is why I have yogurt, by the way. You see how much there's left? We can wait for at least like, what, 15 minutes, maybe? Anybody? Hans, hello. Oh, Paul is here. Hello, Paul. Long time no see. How are you? I have a sneaky sense that Paul is in a place where he can't talk much. I don't know what's giving me that vibe. <clears throat> hey, Robbie. No, not at all. I'm in my office. Hello. Oh, nice. Good to see you. How are you? What have you been up to? Pretty good. Just getting uh, uh have clinic this afternoon with residents. Nice. Amazing. Well, welcome. Thanks for taking time to hang out. Do you, your clinic start at one? Is that the? Mm -hmm. Yep. Awesome. Welcome. Oh, look who, look who's here. It's. I'm so confused. It's Ravi. Why is your name Ravi? No idea, huh? All right, Rez is trying to get his headphones on. We have not started, Prof Rez. There's 10 cases, but we've been waiting for you. Hi, Christian. Good morning, good afternoon. All right, anybody have a case to present to Prof Rez? Yeah, you saw that too, right? There's like a second Ravi that popped up. Okay. Not uh huh. It's bone dry on VMR today. Bone dry. All right. Well, no, no, no. We won't. We won't. We won't. We'll let you like hang out in peace. I promise, Alec. We'll let you hang out in peace. <laughs> Robbie, you want to jump in? Sure, sure. Uh, I kind of got. Uh, I dropped the signal, but did anybody volunteer for a case? No, I think they volunteered you, it seems. Oh, okay. <laughs> yep. So, okay. Yeah. Are we ready? Well, this is almost here. I can tell he's trying to log in. Um, but yeah, let's get going. All right. So we have a 35-year-old woman who has history of depression, who came to the emergency room directly from the airport after travel to Mexico and her complaints were six days of fatigue, jaundice, neck pain, epigastric pain, and right upper, right upper quadrant abdominal pain. A uh, little backstory. So a few days before arrival to Mexico, she had fever, fatigue, non-bloody emesis that progressed to a macular papillar rash on both thighs, also developed jaundice, epigastric and right upper quadrant abdominal pain, low extremity edema, and a nagging headache. Later on, she became delirious. She was found wandering the streets in Mexico, went to a local clinic in Mexico, and received two unknown antibiotics uh, due to having a white count of 14.5. Subsequently, she returned to the US and that's where, I'll, that's where I'll stop the story. And um, you can elaborate on this, Aliquot. Wow, that's an absolutely fascinating Aliquot, Ravi. Um, I think that in these cases, the sequence of events becomes so crucial, maybe more crucial than any other instance, because um, the epidemiology is changing. So the truth is that, um, well, here, let me tell you a quick story. Yesterday, I heard about a case of a patient who had DRESS, drug-induced hypersensitivity syndrome, whose cutaneous involvement only occurred after extensive visceral involvement. Um, 
And that reminded me that like at the end of the day, you cannot be strict about the sequence of events. If condition dress or drug-induced hypersensitivity syndrome is defined by its rash, but the rash can occur later, you have to be flexible with the sequence of events, right? You can totally diagnose a condition in reverse order. So I think having a flexibility on what can happen is important, but it's less crucial to have flexibility here. Why? This person is acutely inflamed. The most common and the most morbid causes of acute inflammation are infections. Infections are predominantly analyzed by understanding whether it's a commensal bacteria or a virus that lives on the body that causes infection like staph aureus or strep. But especially in multi-system infections, it's important to wonder if the infection is exogenous, meaning coming from the world. And where in the world you reside influences what kind of exogenous infection you can get. So again, to sort of iron out the arc of thinking here, the, um, the sequence of events is important in many cases, but it's also important not to be wedded to it because diagnoses can show up in reverse order. The prime example, dress without a rash. But here, acute inflammation equals infection, which is fundamentally influenced by the exposure, i.e. the epidemiology. So absolutely nailing down to the best of our abilities what happened where is really important. And here, where is, was she in the US or was she in Mexico? And in reading it through, it seems like her symptoms started an, a short time after her arrival in Mexico on the order of days. So if this is an infection related to um, her uh, if this is an infection acquired in Mexico, it must be something of a short incubation period. But you see how we make the assumption that it starts in Mexico. It could have started in Mexico on her prior trip, if she ever has any, or it could have started in the US and only been more um, prominent because of the vulnerability that can happen to people when they travel. And that vulnerability can be missing medications, it can be um, uh, uh, behavior changes that tend to happen with travel, so on and so forth. So if this is an infection, um, and it's, if, it's, if this is an infection, it doesn't have to be infection related to Mexico, but if it is, it would be a short incubation period. Now, the lay of the land is complex. It seems to involve the neurological system, the cutaneous system, and the liver. It doesn't have to be the liver, but the case for the liver is strong with both jaundice and abdominal pain. But of course, um, you can have an alternative cause of abdominal pain and hemolysis, or you can have an alternate cause of abdominal pain and Joubert's, or you can actually have hemolysis with gallstones. So the assumption is it's hepatic, but that's not been definitively proven. What operating schema can we begin to launch um, at this stage? Let me check in on res. Joe, Robbie, I'm here listening. Oh, you're to here. You. I just texted you. Amazing. Yeah. Okay. So here, I've rambled enough. I didn't realize you were here. Pop on. And, uh, how much did you want me to update you or what do you know so far? No, no. I listened to you. Uh, it was beautifully laid out. I um, agree with you 100%. And at this point, this is infection until proven otherwise. And it's going to be really interesting to see what those liver chemistry tests um, display. But I do find that the skin is quite a unique signature here. And that um, has to be explained by the ultimate diagnosis. And I'm almost applying our um, returning traveler fever and our returning traveler schema here. And like you said, the most important thing is to apply the incubation period, but also acquire more information. Like what exactly did this young woman do in Mexico? Did she go on any swims in a lake? Did she have exposure to any kinds of animals? All of this will help us prioritize that list of infection, um, infectious CDX. So with all that being said, let me give the mic back to Robbie. Just a clarification, um, I didn't... Um, prepare for this case, but um, it, everything happened in Mexico. So initially, 
because it's a complicated sequence of events. So patient day zero arrived to Mexico. The second day had that sequence of uh, fever, fatigue, non-bloody emesis, worsening jaundice, low extremity edema. By day four had the rash on the thighs, ankle, wrist pain, epigastric, and right upper quadrant pain. And then the seventh day had delirium and went to the clinic where, where she was found to have leukocytosis and uh, was prescribed antibiotics. Uh, so uh, I don't have any past medical history, no history of um, unusual behaviors or, or any substance use or intake, alcohol, anything like that, no smoking. Um, I don't have history of what she did in Mexico. It appears the moment she got there, by the second day, all of this um, happened. And um, by the time she arrived to, we'll jump into the vital signs, by the time she arrived to uh, the emergency room here in the U.S., she had a fever of about 37, pulse rate 110, blood pressure 110 over 80, respiratory rate was about 18, pulse ox 99%. Physical exam, generally, she looked to be in distress. Also visibly jaundiced. Eyes scleral icterus. Cardiovascular and pulmonary was normal. And then on abdominal exam, there was epigastric and right upper quadrant tenderness that was elicited. No issues with the neurological exam. And there was uh, trace pitting edema in the lower extremities. There was no presence of rash at that point when seen about eight days returning back to the U.S., and then there was also um, complaints of having uh, pain in the joints, but the joints weren't um, visibly abnormal. There was no rash overlying the joints. There was no swelling of the joints. And um, I can stop right there uh, for any comments on the examination. Wow, this is so fascinating. And for some reason, just tell everyone, I'm actually in an airport right now, and this probably will be the last aliquot I discuss. So I'm going to be listening to you guys as <laughs> I'll be listening to you guys as I board the plane. Um, Robbie, I think you know we can further confirm that this patient is inflamed. Although the temperature is normal, we see the patient is tachycardic, and there's no reason to not. Um, to not take inflammation at face value here. What's interesting is that the center of gravity of this case, I think lies with the jaundice. You see joint pain and headache are often bystanders. Now, if this patient had a rash, that is not a bystander. Like rash would be something else that would serve as a center of gravity. So here we have to think about jaundice and inflammation. And the first thing you have to rule out with jaundice and inflammation is cholangitis. And we can't do that on the physical exam. So we already know that this patient will need some form of abdominal imaging, CT scan, ultrasound, MRI of the abdomen. Now, Robbie said, um, how do we know that the jaundice is not uh, Gilbert's? This right upper quadrant tenderness really zooms us in to the liver. Um, and the hepatobiliary system. The question is going to become, is this indirect or direct? I think the right upper quadrant tenderness really in the context of inflammation prioritizes a direct hyperbilirubinemia. So I think the problem we're going to be solving is cholestasis. And so when you're solving cholestasis, you have to ask the question, is it intrahepatic or extrahepatic? The liver chemistry test will help us answer that specific question, but ultimately you need some form of imaging. So this patient, for example, could have a hepatic abscess. That would be totally compatible with her clinical presentation. Alternatively, she could have some form of infection, whether it's bacterial, whether it's a bacteria causing a granulomatous process that's causing intrahepatic cholestasis. So as far as next steps, 
I think we need the CBC Chem 7 liver chemistry test and some abdominal imaging. Now, anyone with rash who returns from travel, you have to entertain the idea of rickettsial infections. Um, and rickettsial infections in general, don't they have a hepatocellular pattern of in injury, but not so much cholestatic pattern of injury. You could have Babesia that leads to hemolysis resulting in hyperbilirubinemia and jaundice, but that doesn't usually leave a mark as far as a rash. So I just don't know what to do with the cutaneous findings at this point, but my entire focus is the liver, the biliary system. And I think the imaging is gonna be crucial. And um, yeah, I, Robbie, anything to add before we get some, labs and, and imaging data. That was absolutely beautiful. I hope to, we make high-pitched buzzing sounds in your ears as you board this plane. Um, <laughs> that was absolutely superb. I was just hoping actually to ask a friend in the chat who said something really important to teach us. Yasmin, are you able to, to unmute and tell us more about the nuances within Mexico? You were teaching us that it actually matters where in Mexico this patient is. That would be so important for all of us to hear. Of course, hi everyone. Uh, yeah, like it's different. Like vector uh, diseases, vector transmitted diseases are way more prevalent in tropical areas in Mexico being, I don't know, I think all of you have heard about Cancun. Um, other areas, the near of that, the peninsula of Yucatan, we have a lot of underground caves where people like to swim. So um, we don't really see that in the north of the country. So yeah, it, it's more of a tropical disease. And it's quite, for us, if it's a patient who has been outside doing ecotourism, which is really fashionable right now, uh, we might ask them, okay, uh, any joint pain? If it's more joint pain, we'll think chikungunya. If it's uh, the macropapular rash, we'll think Zika. If there is none of, for clinical reasons, for uh, do a mega clinical reasoning quick, quick, faster, we will think, well, if it's not any of those, go with dengue. I love it. I think you probably just cracked this case. Well, let's remember her wise words and then loop them in at the end. Thank you so much, Yasmin. And where, where are you based? Uh, right now, I am in San Antonio, but I practice. I, I studied in Merida, which is basically two hours from Cancun. It's easier oh. to put you in context. In the context of, <laughs> yes, of where it is. Thank you. You're I welcome. Appreciate that very much. All righty, Ravi, take us home, please. Okay, um, so labs, sodium was 135, potassium 3.5. Um, chloride I don't have, but BUN was 20, creatinine 1.5, glucose was 120. And uh, I'll jump to the AST was 600, ALT 2,813, direct bilirubin 3.5, and lipase 3,234. And I'll give you imaging CT abdomen pelvis with contrast shows diffuse hepat hepatic steatosis, an enlarged edematous pancreas, small volume ascites. The rest of the findings unremarkable. And um, I have a battery panel of labs which I can. Would you want me to give them to you, or should we just comment on the the imaging? You know, I'll just briefly reflect with you, Ravi. I think um, um, this is a very interesting set of data. So, if you if you study the um, if you study the liver enzymes, the first question. Oh, Rez, are you here? You, you should take this since you can still. <laughs> Anytime we can maximize your voice, we gotta we gotta do no, it not, for you. Not at all. Please go ahead. I, I'm still. I haven't boarded yet. Please tackle it like we would any other time, Ravi John. Okay. All right. So I'll say quite simply, because I know there's a lot of data coming that whenever you hear that, whenever you hear that there's injury in the liver, you want to hear, well, you want to understand if it's inside the liver or in the biliary tree. That's the first exercise. And the best test is to get a picture, but the labs can help you. And the presence of a lipase elevation in the context of liver injury implicates the pancreas. 
And when the pancreas is involved, it's easy to jump to the process being in the extrahepatic tree, compressing the bile duct causing liver injury. And that's very possible. However, it's also possible that the patient has a systemic disease with independent intrahepatic and pancreatic involvement. And I think that's the tension in this case is on the CT, you see that there is diffuse um, steatosis in the liver and that there is a large edematous pancreas, but you don't see that the plumbing between them is affected. There's no comment on biliary duct dilation, so on and so forth. So it makes you wonder, are you dealing with a separate disease process in the pancreas and the liver because the connection between the two seems to be normal? And so it becomes a question of, uh, is it, is it, is, are we just not appreciating the connection between the two? Is this patient have acute pancreatitis uh, with compression of the biliary tree causing hepatitis? Or do we have to analyze these two separately? And so I think that's the, the key tension in this case. It's also in the absence of alcohol use that we know of, in the absence of um, gallstones that we found on the CT, you have to wonder, well, wait, we must therefore be dealing with a rare cause um, of pancreatitis. And so what I would do in real life is I would send off viral um, hepatitis serologies. I would send for toxin screen. I would send a triglyceride level to evaluate for those tricky causes of um, hypertriglyceridemia, which might explain the steatosis and the pancreatitis, but also be open to the possibility this is a rare form of pancreatitis, namely infectious pancreatitis, given the inflammation that we heard about. And when you hear infectious form of pancreatitis, there's not many diseases that can do it. Hepatitis B, again, in the context of the liver injury is an example. Leptospirosis and salmonella are the common bacterial causes. And then the liver flukes, which sometimes can go up the wrong tree instead of going up the biliary tree can cause pancreatitis. So I would think about, about those two as a, as a second pass. All right, um, I think Prof. Ross is, is uh, boarding, so I'll give the mic to you, Ravi, to tell us more. Sure, okay. So you'll get those labs that you just requested. Hepatitis was A was negative, B core antibody surface, antigen antibody negative, uh, hep C negative, hep E negative, CMV PCR negative, EBV um, high IgG, but negative for an acute reactivation, HIV negative, Coxsackie AB negative, dengue, which was um, entertained in the chat, also negative, malaria, toxoplasma, leptospirosis, mumps, all found to be negative, uh, ANA negative, AMA negative, anti-smooth muscle negative, IgG4, 16, and the normal range is about 1 to 123, so normal. Stool H. pylori antigen negative, acetaminophen level within normal range. And um, I'll stop there before I tell you the final diagnosis. So, so this is phenomenal, uh, Ravi. And I just can't but wonder what the people around me are thinking as I discuss medicine. <laughs> Hopefully I'm not really uh, sickening anyone around me. And, um, I, and Ravi, I can't wait to dance with you on this aliquot. And really, I think we need to step back and ask the question, what problem are we trying to solve? And for all of the uh, trainees on the chat, when, whenever you see an ASC and ALT, to this degree of elevation, you have to ask the question, does this patient have acute liver failure? And we know the patient doesn't because they're not encephalopathic, although you would want to check an INR, but it's very critical. Why is it critical to diagnose acute liver failure? Because a young patient may need an emergent evaluation for liver transplant. Um, so here we're dealing with severe acute liver injury. That's the problem we're, we're trying to solve. And of course, we're going to have two frames. One in which this patient has just returned from travel from Mexico and another which is going to exclude that. So we're not completely biased. So we're creating two separate DDXs. 
I think right off the back, uh, for me, Robbie, when I see ASC and ALTs to this magnitude are elevated, I think about the viruses, the toxins, ischemic hepatitis, and also gallstone disease. There's, you know, the gallstone disease is an interesting hypothesis. We can't necessarily rule it out with a CT scan. So I'd have a very low threshold to do an MRCP to better evaluate the biliary tree and see if there's anything obstructing that pancreas, especially given the concomitant lipase elevation. So we're not only try, we're not only solving the problem of severe, severe acute liver injury, but we're solving the problem of severe acute pancreatitis. And I think Robbie highlighted that in the beginning of his discussion, how can we connect these two dots? You see, the lab abnormalities are so severe that both of these have to be explained and neither can be dismissed. So then we asked the question with regard to the viruses that were mentioned. I wanna make this point here, two points. One is you have to make sure that you know the patient's immune status. This is a young patient, because if they are immunocompromised, they may not be able to mount the appropriate antibodies we expect while we interpret this very broad workup. So it's gonna be important to know from Ravi, were these antibodies, were these PCRs? Because some illnesses, for example, letho, you may not catch it in the acute phase if you send the serology too early, though you would expect IgM to start creeping up within a week, I would imagine. But sometimes you actually have to send the, uh, the PCR uh, to better understand if any of these infections can be at play. Leptospirosis was an interesting thought that usually presents with a hyperbilirubinemia, interstitial nephritis, exposure to potentially rats. And um, we're seeing that this is negative, but again, we have to be cautious with interpreting these um, antibodies. I think uh, I'm still leaning towards infection, though um, I am also open to some kind of obstruction of that pancreatic duct causing severe acute liver injury and pancreatitis. Robbie, any other infections besides those liver flukes that we haven't yet tested for that could potentially be at play here? Yeah, you know, not that I, not that I know of. I think it really is hep B, which is negative, mumps, lepto, and those liver flukes. Although I think the time course of those liver flukes would be unusual for them to develop so quickly. I'm, I, and I don't know. And I, the other thing is also that this person has steatosis at age 35 and we're not told that she's overweight or has alcohol use or even has, um, has hep C. So um, I think it's a little tricky. I just make sure she's not, I just make sure that her triglycerides aren't through the roof. And beyond that, I'd be stumped in real life. Like I would have to lean on other people. Um, and the triglycerides is a stretch. Like why would they cause liver injury this high? But when you hear steatosis, in the liver and acute pancreatitis, not alcohol, not definitively stones. But yeah, I don't think I can think of anything. And I just make sure that, that her rash isn't xanthalesmas and that she's not uh, has acute pancreatitis from triglycerides. And um, then that after that, I think I would have to lean hard on ID or, or GI. And I'm right there with, uh, thank you. I'm right there with Dr. Williams that like, I'm not sure like Letho is just such a great fit. Although like, primarily it's hyperbilirubinemia as opposed to that parasitic liver injury. So I'm really curious to see what Ravi is going to teach us in this case. And thank you all for letting me dance with you from the airport. I really appreciate all of you. Absolutely. So um, a lot of great thoughts in the chat. And I mean, everybody's right on. There's just so much data to, to sort of sort through and really what to latch in on. But then I'll give you the the last test that came back. So the chikungunya IgM was positive, and what um, I guess Yasmin was right um, on to what was possibly going on. But with that pancreas, it was very difficult because I don't usually associate it with chikungunya. But um, this case is interesting in that the pancreatitis was this severely involved. It's usually seen, maybe seen in twelve percent or two percent. Sorry of presentations. So typically chick chikungunya means bent over in pain and it follows this incubation of about one to 12 days with this patient. I gave you this kind of this week or eight days of manifestations of these symptoms. Um, and then you have past the initial two, six days, then you have five to seven days of viremia. 
And during that initial viremic stage, you'll have the fever that we talked about, myalgias, polyarthralgias or polyarthritis, and then you have this rash. And by the time this patient had arrived, this rash had dissipated. So it's not a, a malignant rash or mischievous rash that we get. Um, commonly, like 10%, you might see that are asymptomatic, um, but then some may have subsequent or sequelae of this infection with polyarthralgias for years. So this case I thought was really interesting because of um, this, this involvement of all these different organs. You could just follow any lead with all of these and go off into a deep rabbit hole, and it was kind of difficult. But once you have all this um, battery or panel of labs, it can be pretty easy. But just, just under identifying that this could be chikungunya coming from that area. And I'll tell you, Asmin, it's the southwest part of Mexico. So not Cancun, but I went to Cancun. I got uh, COVID. <laughs> I didn't get anything exotic, but I guess uh, COVID is still pretty prevalent there. But um, definitely in that area, I think it is quite prevalent. Well, Ravi, this is unbelievable. Well, one, I'm so glad that we we put a pin in Yasmin's thoughts and here they are back to educate us again. And I am so humbled. I think that my illness script for chikungunya was not flexible enough to bend it into this case, not at all. And in retrospect, I think the the migratory rash and the jo joint symptoms that you were um, uh, that you were alluding to were certainly pins to um, uh, to at least consider that hypothesis. And maybe just given the base rate alone. Um, uh, we'll, 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 could anchor in those things and then add the liver injury and the pancreatitis. This is, uh, this is really enlightening and very educational. Thank you so much for presenting it. Prof Rez? Oh my gosh. Um, definitely huge shout out to Yasmin. Uh, excellent job with mentioning the diagnosis early on. And I think that if we were on the first aliquot and if you actually, if someone can share our fever in a returning traveler schema, I would appreciate that because you'll see that the DDX is right there with uh, the chikungunya, dengue, and Zika as um, problems to consider. And I think that I just think of chikungunya as joint, rash, and fever, and headache. I don't think of it as causing severe acute liver injury. So that was very, um, very helpful. And thank you so much, Ravi. I think, I think this is my lesion and my thinking was I just focused on the liver and the pancreas, but I should have said skin, joint, liver, and pancreas. And then the chicken, gunya, dengue, zika would explain the joint and the skin. And then we should have been flexible to include that in our script. Thank you so much. And here it is, folks. You guys can see it. Thank you for pulling it up. Mike, to you, Shema. Okay, hey everyone. So I got kicked off for a second. I'm so happy Deborah helped me. So I will start. So uh, at first we had uh, acute inflammation as, um, and we were uh, talking that uh, this equals uh, infection and considering is it a commensal bacteria like the Staph aureus or if we have multi-system involvement, consider exogenous bacteria and also always think of epidemiolo epidemiology or the exposure like if we have water, animals or any sexual context because we were thinking of fever in a returning traveler in this case. And if we have jaundice and inflammation, the first thing to do is um, what Reza said, rule out cholangitis and um, also the combination of ripe upper qu uh, quadrant tenderness. And we were thinking of, is there any liver or um, hepatobiliary system involvement? And, it, uh, and also the thing is we were prioritizing a direct hyperbilirubinemia if we have uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, if we have inflammation together um, with right upper qu uh, quadrant tenderness. And then the, uh, the, the question is also, is, is, uh, if there is a cholestasis, is it intra or extra hepatic? And the first thing to do is the imaging also. And then we were also thinking of the joint pain. We were rather considering this as a bystander. And then uh, what Yasmin told us, very important, this patient was in a tropical zone uh, and then consider vector transmitted diseases like if there is joint pain or severe polyatrogia, think of chikungunya. If there is a macular papular rash, it's rather Zika. And if it's, if it's not any of those, it's uh, rather dengue. And um, 
we had um, high elevations of the transaminases. And if we have AST or ALT above 1,000, think of a severe acute liver injury. So think of viral issues, toxins, ischemic hepatitis, or gallstone disease. And uh, what we also learned is that um, gallstone diseases, uh, diseases uh, are not always good visible in CT. So MRCP is much better to evaluate it. And um, then um, coming to the solution of this case, so we had fever, myalgia, rash, severe pol polyatrology in a tropical zone, consider chikungunya. <laughs> so thank you very much. And I hope to see you again soon. And thank you, uh, thank you so much for this great case. Thank you, Shay, my excellent teaching points. Ravi, is there anything going on this weekend? Oh, yeah, we have a uh, global VMR tomorrow and then student morning report with Jack on Sunday. So that's the weekend schedule. Uh, appreciate you, Reza, uh, chiming in from the airport. Very difficult. Right. Take and care, it, and it definitely And it definitely wasn't an easy case to chime in <laughs> from the airport. <laughs> Thanks so much, Robbie. Take care, my friend. <laughs> Bye. Yeah, take care. Take care, everybody. Bye.